family. All praise to the most high. So today we will be debunking more heathens. So um, I know a lot of you guys are familiar with my fake pyramids of shit video. And most of you, um, if you've been following me for a while, you are very apt to a lot of my research as it pertains to the true holy land and the true ancient holy lands. Um, so today I will be proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that America is Egypt. And when I say America is Egypt, um, America or the Americas is a portion of the land that ancient Egypt used to lie in. Now, for a lot of people who are new to this uh, theory, I don't even call it a theory, this is the truth. Um, the other place isn't even a theory, it's a theme park that they set up over there and they refabricated world history. This is beyond a shadow of a doubt. So what I will be doing today, especially for you skeptics, I will be debunking all of your quote unquote academia, all of your top scholars. I'll be debunking all heathens today. And we'll be doing it using the same resources that they've been using. Now, just the name Egypt in general is synonymous with the Old Testament, correct? So when we're looking at this, and even when we're talking about models of the world, understand that much of the geography that we think is the true geography of the earth is based upon the Old Testament. So what I'll be doing today is not only going through the history of ancient Egypt, but I'm going to be going through the history of ancient Egypt as it exchanges hands into kingdoms. In addition to exchanging hands into kingdoms, we'll also be running parallel the biblical timeline with what we think ancient Egypt's timeline is. Um, so before we get started, understand that Hebrew and Egyptian chronology is at odds with one another. To believe Egyptian chronology means that during the entire flood of Noah, Egypt was at the height of its prosperity. So how is that even possible? If Egyptian chronology is supposed to be taken legitimately, does that mean that the flood didn't exist? Or does that mean that Egyptian chronology as we know it has been totally fabricated? Now, before we even get into that, and I will be giving you guys an outline, and I'll also be giving you guys plenty of cited academic resources in order to fact check a lot of the information that I'm putting here. So especially for you skeptics, when we're going along the lines of trying to define Mithraim, from Egypt, you'll understand what I'm talking about because chances are, if you're a skeptic on this subject, you're probably not doing your research correctly. Um, and very easily and effectively, I will be debunking all of the bullshit. So by the end of the video, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Americas are indeed the lands of ancient Egypt, in addition to a lot of other ancient holy lands as well. So don't just think that I'm saying that the entire landscape of America was all ancient Egypt. All right. So let's get into defining the context of Egypt. There are two ways that we can define Egypt. OK, first of all, we can define it simply as Mitzrayim, which is the son of Ham. Now, the word Egypt itself is Greek. Now, of course, we speak a bastardized language as the words are flowing out of my pie hole, we don't really understand the true contextual meaning behind or the difference behind the contrast of the word Misraim and Egypt. First of all, let's just get down to the foundational definition of Misraim was not just the son of Ham, okay? Misraim actually has dual meaning. Mitzra and Ayim actually have two different meanings. Now, when we're looking at this in a biblical context, other than Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, other than being the son of Ham, is supposedly the name representative of the lands of ancient Egypt. Okay? So, over time, obviously, once 
the Greek took over, things got translated over. And much of the meaning of the words and the definitions that we think we know, this is exactly where much of the contextual understanding gets lost. So Mitzrayim, son of Ham, also the land of the upper and lower Egypt. Okay, so we want to say upper or lower Egypt. Um, these are descriptive adjectives based upon who ruled each area. So in addition to Mitzra and Ayim, the dual meaning for upper and lower Egypt. All right. So upper Egypt was said to be ruled by Horus and lower Egypt is said to be ruled by Seth. Or set, excuse me. So the contextual odds that these two, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, deities or even rulers at the time, because we don't really know the context and what they actually mean. Because we know that these are deities. We know these are Egyptian deities. But we also know that at some point in the past that uh, the gods intermingled with human and in many ways um, half human, half whatever you want to call them, um, were considered gods on earth. And we're going to be really getting into that as we discuss the lineage and history of Egypt. So, for example, you have upper that has to do with Horus, lower that has to do with Set. Um, something I noticed just uh, geographically, uh, when you think about a Horus and Set, the sunrise and sunset, so you could look at it essentially like east and west, North and South, however you want to look at sunrises, that's what seems to be going on here. So an additional meaning is the house of Ta, okay? Now, I really want to go over this because I think this is probably one of the most important meanings or important uh, adjectives as we're going into understanding Egypt on an etymological level, okay? So um, the Egyptian deity, Ta. P-T-A-H. The P is silent. And um, so I didn't say this, but Ta is pronounced Ta. All right. Now, um, we can see that there. And Ta is the Egyptian creator God. Similar to the accounts in Genesis, it is stated through Egyptian myth that Ta not only thought of the world, thought the world into existence, he also spoke the word, spoke the world into existence. So thought and spoke the world into existence. So when we're looking at this, when you're just the name Ta, um, if we were to, for those of you who have seen the smartest beast in the field, when we're going back to Genesis, um, this would be almost this would be almost a similar deity to what they're saying the Genesis 1 creator is, all right? The land of Ta, the house of Ta. So in short, who is Ta? The creator God. So that would be the house of the creator God. All right, now we're gonna get a little bit deeper because now we're gonna go to what the word Egypt means today and how it got that meaning, all right? So, Obviously, there was a time when Greece, and we'll be talking about this, and we'll, we're going to go through scripture as well. We're going to go through scripture chronologically, so you're going to see these places that come up. Um, you're going to see mainly Egypt, and you're going to see the context in which Egypt comes up each time as we go throughout scripture, telling stories. Okay, so we're going to start off with Abraham, and then we're going to end with the fall of Egypt when it gets into the hands of Rome. And we're going to really analyze the stories in between. Now, of course, when we're analyzing the stories in between, we cannot go with Egyptian history because there is none there from the standpoint that includes the world. So, of course, we will be using scripture and we'll be cross-referencing pretty much all of the major plot sequences in which Egypt plays somewhat of a role that we've talked about before. But we're just going to be, we'll be expanding on that a lot more. So, Egypt obviously is a Greek word, okay? Now, this is where we're really going to get into not just scripture, but we're also going to have to 
just in order to understand the heathens and where they come from and their mythology and their history, we're going to have to get into mythology ourselves. So we're going to have to cross-reference Egyptian mythology with Greek mythology. And we're going to be doing that, of course, with scripture. And what you're going to start seeing, things are things will start working themselves out. Um, I'm really... I'm really excited for those of you who've actually seen the smartest beast in the field and, and, and you're caught up to the episode because this stuff kind of falls in line with understanding who's who in terms of genetics also. So let's tell the story of Greece and how Greece becomes Egypt. I'm actually not going to tell that story. That story will get told as I'm going through the history of the Bible. Um, but right now we're going to give you just, just what we're doing now is from um, a, 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 a little, little, an etymological standpoint, I'm going to show you how it becomes Egypt. Okay. Now, Egyptus, son of Belus, is who? Now, Belus just happens to be the son of Poseidon and Libya. So I want to, I want to, um, and this is where things get funny. All right. So you see here, Egyptus is the son of Belus. All right. Now, these people are all um, what you would call uh, Greek gods, so to speak, or they're considered in the lineage of Greek gods. So you have Poseidon, then you have Libya. Now, I want to take a look at Libya really quickly because Libya is said to be um, the lands. When I say the lands, we're going to go back because now Libya has a name and it's a woman and it is the mother of Egyptus, right? But... Um, the house of Lud under the Hamites, okay, were supposed to be represented by Libya. So this should be Lud, son of Ham. If we were going to draw these connections here, and if we, we don't even know that this is Libya, daughter of Lud. We don't know that. Here's what we do know. That she is what we like to call, where is it at? I don't even see it on here. She's part of the catalog of women. All right, I didn't see it here. So she's part of the catalog of women. So um, back in the day, there were women who were from certain lineages who were selected, okay? They were selected as breeding partners or sources of eggs for Greek gods or I would say split angel human lineages. So the catalog of women is a very interesting uh, just concept in general, where as opposed to men just going out and getting a woman there, there's actually, uh, I don't know what it is, a group of women. I mean, I guess you could look it up as well. Now, this is just based off what I remember, um, but it's, it's a group of women who are essentially born and bred to lay with, you know, gods, so to speak. And so Libya is supposedly part of the catalog of women. So this gets even a little bit better. So Belus, the father of Egyptus, according to, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's Diodorus. Don't completely quote me on that. But, it, you know, with some of one of these Roman Greek scribes, um, according to Diodorus or I don't know, one of the guys. Um, Belus founded a colony on the Euphrates, okay? In addition, he appointed priest astrologers, a.k.a. Chaldeans. I know some of y'all say Chaldeans or Chaldees. I call them Chaldeans, all right? So, we know here that the priest astrologers were Chaldeans. Now, for those of you who really get into scripture, into scripture, you see that all the time. You always see the Chaldees, the Ur of the Chaldees. Where did Abraham come from? The Chaldees, the Chaldees. So even when we start cross-referencing what we know uh, about Egyptian history, we can start to we can start to learn more about scripture and what's really going on in the stories and where the stories are play, taking place and who people are or uh, what's the word, characteristics of certain nations. So we know for a fact that when we're talking about a Chaldean or a Chaldean, 
we're most likely talking about an astrologer, a priest astrologer. Okay? So, according to this legend, Belus founded a colony on the Euphrates and appointed priest astrologers Chaldeans. So, a couple of things that I want to reconcile here. You see the word Euphrates, and I did check that. It, it, it is said Euphrates, but we all know that, you know, Egyptus Nile, the Euphrates is in no way synonymous with the Nile in terms of what we think in our brains. But of course, if you saw one of the videos I did, I think it was the Babylon video, but we very easily debunked the fact that the Mississippi slash Nile is the Euphrates. As a matter of fact, we know for a fact that the Nile was never mentioned by name in scripture as a specific river. And we know that when they're referring to the Nile, they're referring to a what? A stream, a brook, or a tributary of a much larger body of water and not a single body of water. And what I have also done um, is I've, I've pulled up a few verses is in the Bible as well that we'll look at in the actual, uh, in the actual Torah and the Tanakh. Uh, we'll actually look at uh, some geographic characteristics that we can use to easily debunk the Nile River being over there. So uh, it's a beautiful thing, but we also know that the Nile is synonymous with Egypt, but we also know that it's not the Nile that we are talking about. The Nile are Nilios or Nilios, okay? And we've gone through this again. Is the Greek river god. Okay? So, one of the first things you must understand here is that the meanings between the Nile and the Euphrates have been confounded into two different rivers. Okay? You have the Euphrates. Then you have the Nile, same river, all right? The Euphrates is the big, the Nile is the little. And I don't even want to call it the Nile being the little. The Nile is referred to are the brooks, creeks, or streams of the much larger river, the great river, the Euphrates, okay? So just essentially, the meanings of those two rivers have been confounded in our brains. And it's interesting because we all know about the Nile and we can tell that Egyptian history in many ways uh, gets pushed into our brain academically because for some reason, people don't seem to want to give true credit to the only history book that matters and that's the Torah. Because the Torah is the foundation of all this knowledge and we can actually see that. We, we can, once we understand the words that were written down for us to finally understand, we can actually see a lot of this stuff being played out. So we know what's true, we know what's false, we know what's being attributed to these people is actually something that came long before them. And so learning the Torah um, is just foundational to understanding how deception works, okay? So we all know that the Nile is the Euphrates, the Nile being tributaries, creeks, or streams. They, they literally confounded the meaning of this word. Now getting back to Egyptus, son of Belus, this is where the current lands of Egypt have been named. Or this is for whom the current lands of Egypt have been named. Egyptus, son of Belus, founded a colony on the Euphrates. Hmm. Appointed priest astrologers. Hmm. Now this is coming from the Greek, okay, guys? We got to understand something. That a lot of the accounts that you're going to read, the Strabos, the Herodotus, the Diodorus, the uh, whoever does it, <laughs> uh, the Herodotus, I already forgot the dude's name. Uh, anybody who you see during, um, who who's actually transliterating a lot of this past history, they're doing it in the Greek era, okay? So this has already been, much of this history has already been established. And what they are doing from this point on is transliterating it into their own understanding, all right? And this is where things get lost in translation. Sometimes purposely, sometimes accidentally. So 
Egyptus. So the myth about Egyptus is he had 50 sons. 50 sons with multiple different women. Um, I think he, I'm not sure if he actually caught Antonio Cromartie, but, um, or I'm not sure if Antonio Cromartie caught him, but I'm sure he's close. But the myth of 50 sons and the Danaids, all right, or Danaids. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. But apparently, Egyptus had 50 sons. And he sent his sons to get married to his brother's daughters. And his brother tells his daughters to murder their husbands on their wedding night. So according to the legend, 49 of the 50 sons actually got murdered. And then the 50th son who didn't get murdered avenged his brother's deaths. Um, and so this is, <laughs> this is a little mythology tied around Egypt. So I want you guys to go ahead and write this down because we're going to keep it moving. I just want to make sure that we get this. Oh, yeah, I didn't even talk about this. We'll talk about this really quickly. We're going to get into this later. But the, the ancient name that the Egyptians called Egypt was Tamari. Okay. So we can see a few things here, okay? So we already know Ta has actually, Ta and Mary have a few different meanings, and you'll actually hear be pronounced Tamara or Tamara, okay? But what we should know is Ta and Mary, etymologically we know that the syllables actually break up the phonetical meanings of both of those sounds. So we've got Ta Mary, and we can actually um we can actually go ahead and relate that. To who? Ta. Okay? That's easy. Now, we could, I'm sure that somebody else has their own proclamation of exactly what the meaning is, but that's right there in the Egyptian hieroglyphic, blah, 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 the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary. It's right there. Ta, Mary. And then you also have Mary meaning stone. Okay? So if we were to combine those words, that would be Ta stone or the stone of Ta. Interesting, the stone of Ta. The stone of Ta. Ta Mary. What does that also sound like? If we were to reverse the syllables, it would be Mary Ta. Interesting. Mary Ta. Ta Mary. Kind of sounds like this place I know. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Make sure you get the notes because we're going to be going on to the next board scribble. Hopefully you can read all that stuff. And uh, what I'll do is zoom. I'll zoom in as well. This is true for some periods, but for others, like the ancient empire, we know very little. And that's why, finally, your questions are ours. When it comes to the building of the pyramids, we have a lot of theories, but no written account. Appendix B, The Problem with Egyptian Chronology. In 1886, historian George Rawlinson began his chapter on Egyptian chronology with this statement. It is a patent fact and one that is beginning to obtain general recognition that the chronological element in early Egyptian history is in a state of almost hopeless obscurity. There are several kinds of chronological documents, including the actual monuments. The chronological value of these various sources of information is, however, in every case, slight. The great defect of these monuments is their incompleteness. The Egyptians had no era. They drew out no chronological schemes. They cared nothing but to know how long each incarnate god, human or bovine, had condescended to tarry on the earth. They recorded carefully the length of life of each apis bull and the length of the reign of each king, but they neglected to take note of the intervals between one apis bull and another and omitted to distinguish the sole reign of a monarch from his joint reign with others. And we are back. You can go ahead and take these notes here. So what we're going to be doing now is 
we're going to take a detailed trip through scripture and in particularly we're going to be highlighting Egypt and in each place that Egypt comes up. Now obviously Egypt and Canaan are places that are mentioned I don't know a lot. Probably over I think if I'm not mistaken I think Egypt has over 400 mentions. Okay. So I looked at all 400 of them, but I'm not going to present you with every time the word Egypt comes up because we're, we're really just looking to really just try to understand certain things. Now, if there's a place where Egypt comes up that um, that should be looked at, that maybe I haven't covered throughout this video, definitely bring it to my attention, um, which I'm I would be happy to look at because. Uh, more so than anything, um, right now, too much information doesn't exist. So any information that we can uh, credibly ascertain that leads us to the truth is well worth the time of investigation. So first, we are going to be looking at the first time that the word Egypt is brought up in Scripture. Now, I want to make this point again. We In the first part, we... Define the differences between Mitzrayim and Egypt. So, for consumption purposes, I'm just going to be using Egypt throughout because that is the tongue in which I speak. This is a bastardized Greek variation of whatever language that they were trying to hide. So, what we're trying to do now is just figure out um, what are the characteristics of Egypt. So, in Genesis 12.10, which is the first mention of Egypt in the Old Testament or really in the Torah. Genesis 12, 10. Okay. Now, in what context is Egypt mentioned? So, there was a famine in the land. And, of course, Abram, at the time, him and his wife Sarai, go down to Egypt to sojourn or to basically take refuge. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the story, but we could talk about that a little bit later. Okay, the point of this is just to say, okay, there was a famine in the land and they went to Egypt as a place of refuge, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and put a famine refuge in terms of a theme that can be legitimately ascertained just by reading Genesis 12, 10. So what that means is they had food. More so than anything, we know that there was food in Egypt, all right? So now there was a whole story that happened um, and eventually Abram ends up leaving Egypt with more riches. He literally goes down to Egypt and he's literally afraid of his life because he's got a beautiful wife and he says to tell, he tells his wife to say, if we get captured, tell me you're my sister so I can live. And of course she does that. And by virtue of another man taking his wife, that other guy gets cursed. And of course gives Abraham all of these gifts and Abraham leaves Egypt with more than he came with. Okay, so that is another thing, all right? That is another thing, okay? So more than just a place of refuge, it's actually a place that you could come up out of and might be on the good side. So we don't know how broke or poor or how, you know, humble Abram was at the time before he went to Egypt. I imagine he had to be somewhat humble if he didn't have food to feed himself and his wife. And he literally had to go somewhere else to get food. But when he returns from Egypt, he returns with riches. So you can go live the American dream or the Egyptian dream. So in the next, the next time that we see Egypt it is in Genesis 26. And Isaac is being told not to go into Egypt. Again, there's another famine in the land and he is being instructed to not go into Egypt. So I really want to stay here for a second because 
once again, we can still tie in the fact that obviously Egypt is the place that seems to be a common location of refuge when everything, when there's no food, people go to Egypt. Um, and that can easily be established through the first two right there, 12, 10, 26. All right. Do not go into Egypt. And this is during the time that Isaac received the promise. We see in Genesis 26, we can see that Isaac dwelt in Gerar and did not go into Egypt. So the next time we see Egypt or next time Egypt becomes uh, a major part of the story is really when we get into the children, the children of Isaac, especially once we're talking about the sons, the sons and the brothers. And in particular, we're going to be talking about Joseph. So the story of Joseph starts a few chapters after Isaac. We're in Genesis 37 now. So during the story of Joseph, um, he was feeling himself. You know, I'm just going to paraphrase. Joseph was feeling himself and, you know, he, you know, he was kind of like, he was like LaMelo Ball. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying LaMelo Ball feels like this, but imagine LaMelo, is it LaMelo? Yeah. Imagine LaMelo thinking he's the best ball brother, but he's the baby. And all the brothers have already paid their dues and done with the war and everything. Well, Joseph was like that. He was the baby. And apparently he was more comely as well. So not only was he the baby, but basically because he was the youngest, he got to reap all the benefits from all the wars and battles that his brothers had fought and won. Um, during this, obviously, uh, he exalted himself. And this, in turn, caused a little jealousy among his brothers. Uh, long story short, um, and he obviously was receiving favor from his father and his, his brothers wasn't feeling it. So they sold him. All right. They sold him to some Ishmaelites. They didn't know exactly what to do with him. They had him in the pit for a little bit, trying to decide what to do. And um, eventually they sold him. Now, this is kind of a crazy part of the story because they sold their brother, but the brothers had to hide the lie. Think about it. We're talking about Levi, Simeon, Judah, Benjamin. They all had to hide the fact that they had sold their brother to Ishmaelites and they took him to Egypt. They had to hide that from their father, who was distraught. So Joseph gets sold, goes down into Egypt. And once again, we start to see a come up, right? So he ends up serving under Potiphar, who is the captain of the Pharaoh guard. So he ends up serving for Potiphar. He just happens to be part of the king's guard or what they call the Pharaohic guard. Now, going back up, and we're going to stop here because this is this is uh, kind of what I wanted you to see here when we're talking about Pharaohic and Pharaoh. Okay? So I want, I want to go here because we're trying to figure out certain things. Okay? So the book of Jasher runs parallel to Genesis. For those of you who don't know, um, in many ways, sometimes even the chapters line up. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. Where if you go to chapter 12 in um, Genesis, it'll be chapter 12 in Joshua. Well, during this time, it actually is chapter 14. And they very similarly line up. And what you can do is chronologically, um, you can chronologically just figure that out. So in Jasher, I forget exactly. I'm not going to go all the way and read Jasher, but I will read... Um, just an excerpt, just to let you know exactly who was Pharaoh, okay? Who was Pharaoh, not at the time of Joseph, okay? But who was Pharaoh at the time of Abraham? Because we know that Joseph served under Potiphar, but Potiphar wasn't a Pharaoh, he was part of the Pharaohic guard. But we do know there was a Pharaoh in Egypt during the time that Abram and Sarai sojourned in Egypt. So when we read chapter 14, in the book of Jasher, this is how we 
can start to, uh, I would say, cross analyze our resources. So during those days that Abraham was sojourning in Egypt, and I'm going to see here, I believe that's in. Yeah, so it's, it's just after chapter 13. So we're going to go to chapter 14 really quickly. And um, I'm just going to read from the book of Jasher. And um, you can get a little more insight into what's going on. Okay, so I had just gone to chapter 13 to make sure it's during the same chronological time period as um, Abram and Sarai, just to double check again. So I'm going to start at Jasher 14, 1. In those days... There was in the land of Shinar a wise man who had understanding and all wisdom and of a beautiful appearance, but he was poor and indigent. His name was Rikion, and he was hard set to support himself. And he resolved to go to Egypt to Osiris, the son of Anam, king of Egypt, to show the king his wisdom, for perhaps he might find grace in his sight, to raise him up, give him maintenance, and Rikion did so. And when Rikion came to Egypt, he asked the inhabitants of Egypt concerning the king, and the inhabitants of Egypt told him the custom of the king of Egypt. For it was the custom of the king of Egypt that when he went from his royal palace and was seen abroad only one day in the year. And after that, the king would return to his palace and remain there for the rest of the year. And on the day that the king went forth, he passed judgment in the land, and everyone having a suit, came before the king that day to obtain his request. And when Rikion heard of this custom in Egypt and that he could not come into the presence of the king, he grieved greatly and was very sorrowful. And in the evening, Rikion went out and found a house in ruins, formerly a bake house in Egypt. And he abode there all night in bitterness of soul and pinched with hunger and slept was removed, and sleep was removed from his eyes. And Rikion considered within himself what he should do in the town until the king made his appearance, and how he might maintain himself there. And there he arose in the morning and walked about and met in his way those who sold vegetables and various sorts of seed with which they supplied the inhabitants. And Rikion wished to do the same in order to get a maintenance in the city. But he was unacquainted with the custom of the people, and he was like a blind man among them. And he went and obtained vegetables to sell for his support. And the rabble assembled about him and ridiculed him, and took his vegetables from him and left him nothing. And then he rose up from there in bitterness of soul, and he went sighing to the bakehouse in which he had remained all the night before, and he slept there the second night. And on that night again, he reasoned with himself, how could he save himself from starvation? And he devised a scheme how to act. And he rose up in the morning and acted ingeniously and went and hired 30 strong men of the rabble, carrying their war instruments in their hands. And he led them to the top of the Egyptian sepulcher. And he placed them there. Now I want to stop here. The, the thing that kind of got me about this story now, I've read the story quite a few times, is that we know Rikion was broke, or we think he was broke. Um, so I always wondered how he was able to hire the rabble and go to the Egyptian sepulcher, okay? So, um, like I said, we're just reading the story about Ricky, all right, who was the first Pharaoh, and we're getting into why he's called Pharaoh. Just follow along. And let's see here, where do we leave off? And he commanded them saying, Thus saith the king, strengthen yourselves. Okay, maybe, maybe as I'm looking at this, maybe he just uses the king of his, maybe he's using the king's word um, to his favor, as opposed to really paying them to do it. Maybe there was some, I don't know, some exchange that was other than just 200 pieces of silver or whatever it would be. So maybe there was some other exchange. And he commanded them saying, thus saith the king, Strengthen yourselves and be valiant men and let no man be buried here until 200 pieces of silver be given and then he may be buried. And those men did according to the order of Rikion to the people of Egypt the whole of that year. 
And in eight months' time, Rikion and his men gathered great riches of silver and gold, and Rikion took a great quantity of horses and other animals, and he hired more men, and he gave them horses, and they remained with him. And when the year came round at the time the king went forth into the town, all the inhabitants of Egypt assembled together to speak to him concerning the work of Rikian and all his men. And the king went forth on the appointed day, and all the Egyptians came before him and cried unto him, saying, May the king live forever. What is this thing thou doest in the town to thy servants, not to suffer a dead body to be buried until such, until much silver and gold be given? Was there ever the like unto this done in the whole earth from the days of former kings? Yea, even from the days of Adam until this day that the dead should not be buried only for a set price. We know it to be a custom of kings to take a yearly tax from the living, but thou dost not only do this, but from the dead also thou exactest a tax day by day. Now, O king, we can no more bear this. For the whole city is ruined on this account, and dost thou not know it? And then the king heard all that had spoken. He was very wroth, and in his anger burned within him at this affair, for he had known nothing of it. And the king said, Who and where is he that dares to do this wicked thing in my land without my command? Surely you will tell him. And they told him all the works of Rikion and all his men. And the king's anger was aroused, and he ordered Rikion and his men to be brought before him. And Rikion took about a thousand children, sons and daughters, clothed them in silk and embroidery, and he set them upon horses and sent them to the king by means of this. And he also took a great quantity of silver and gold and precious stones and a strong, beautiful horse as a present for the king, with which he came before the king and bowed down to the earth before him. And the king, his servants, and all the inhabitants of Egypt wondered at the work of Rikion. And they saw his riches and presented and the present that he had brought to the king. And it greatly pleased the king, and he wondered at it. And when Rikion sat before him, the king asked him concerning all of his works. And Rikion spoke all his words wisely before the king, his servants, and all the inhabitants of Egypt. And when the king heard the works of Rikion and his wisdom, Rikion found grace in his sight, and he met with the grace and kindness from all the servants of the king, from all the inhabitants of Egypt on the account of his wisdom and excellent speeches. And from that time they loved him exceedingly. And the king answered and said to Rikion, Thy name shall no more be called Rikion, but Pharaoh shall be thy name, since thou didst exact a tax from the dead, and he called his name Pharaoh. And the king and his subjects loved Rikion for his wisdom, and they consulted with all the inhabitants of Egypt to make him prefect under the king. And all the inhabitants of Egypt and his wise men did so, and it was made law in Egypt. And they made Rikion Pharaoh prefect under Osiris, king of Egypt. And Rikion Pharaoh governed over Egypt, daily administering justice to the whole city. But Osiris the king would judge the people of the land one day in the year when he went out to make his appearance. And Rikion Pharaoh cunningly usurped the government of Egypt and he exacted a tax from all of the inhabitants of Egypt. And all of the inhabitants of Egypt greatly loved Rikion Pharaoh and they made a decree to call every king that should reign over them and their seed in Egypt, Pharaoh. Therefore, all the kings that reigned in Egypt from that time forward were called Pharaoh unto this day. Wow. Rigion devised a scheme to charge people to bury their loved ones. Over the span of approximately eight months, he gathered so many riches that he sent lavish gifts, animals, silver and gold to the king. Once he was able to do this, he got favor with the king. And according to Jasher 14, he spoke wisely to the king. 
And the king called him Pharaoh because he exacted a tax from the dead. Just want to make sure I put this here. Pharaoh taxes the dead. Just, just want you guys to understand the foundational meaning of the word Pharaoh. I don't know if that means dead body tax collector. I don't know how that's broken up. But we do know from Jasher that he is called Pharaoh because he exacted a tax from the dead. This was during the life of Abraham. Abraham goes down during a famine with his wife Sarai. Abraham leaves Egypt with more than he came. Genesis 26, don't go into Egypt because there's another famine. Dwell in Gerar. Joseph, sold by his brothers to Ishmaelites, ends up in Egypt working under Potiphar. Now we could go on, we could tell the long story of Joseph, but all you really need to know is Joseph became great in Egypt. All right. So once again, we have another story of somebody going down into Egypt and coming out on top. All right. So Joseph became so great in Egypt. They honored him. He had lands. He had riches. He had everything. And furthermore, and I think this is really huge. He saved the country from famine. Genesis 50, 26. Joseph died. Now, after Joseph dies, we are now going to the book of Exodus. Now remember, the theme here is Egypt. We're not getting into every portion of biblical history. We're highlighting Egypt, all right? So, after the death of Joseph, the new king in Egypt knew not the works of Joseph. Or the legend of his family. So the new king in Egypt did not have any reverence for Joseph. And what happened after that? He started oppressing the Israelites. In addition to oppressing and this is another thing that we're going to be hitting on uh, throughout a few different stories in scripture, okay? Um, and we're just going to call this the massacre of the innocents uh, to kill newborn sons, okay? So, not only did the new king in Egypt have no love for Joseph, he had no love for Joseph's family, he also wanted to kill all newborn sons who are Israelites. So, and, the, and this is just, this is a story that um, we've heard before. Now, I don't know, you don't just hear it, because you're going to hear the story twice in the Exodus, okay? You're going to hear it once, where the Pharaoh commands, or the king of Egypt commands all the midwives to kill all of the Hebrew boys, but the girls can live, okay? The whole point was, it was a population control thing. The king of Egypt was looking to diminish the Israelite numbers, all right? But the theme of killing firstborn sons is something that we're going to see throughout the Bible, uh, throughout scripture. This is something that we actually saw um, before the story of Abraham, okay? So, in, in the beginning of Genesis, between Abraham and Isaac, or between Terah and Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, we see that there is a theme that people want to kill firstborn sons of certain nations, of certain people. Now, in many ways, I think there's probably a lot of prophecy tied into it, and they're probably using ast astrological 
you know, signs in the skies to determine there's a new star in the east when somebody's born today, blah, blah, blah. We've seen that before. We saw it with Abraham. And of course, we, we heard it somewhere else also. So these are things, these are themes that we see throughout the Bible. This is something that we're going to see again. Okay. So I just wanted to uh, put that, you know, put that on the paper. Now we're going to get into before I'm going to clean off the board. Then we're going to get, basically, we're going to get into Exodus here. We'll get into the Exodus and then we're going to start getting into Chronicles and then we're going to start getting into some of the prophets. Okay. So right now I just wanted to kind of get the story leading the story of Egypt leading up into the Exodus. Okay. So long story short, they didn't fuck with the Israelites. Long story short, the king not knew not the works of Joseph. He didn't know that Joseph saved the whole entire country from famine. He doesn't care. Let's see here. Yeah, Exodus is right there in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus 1 13 says he began oppressing the children of Israel under rigorous bondage. Okay? So when we get back to here, we're just gonna we're gonna come back and we're gonna come to the rise of Moses. All right. So go ahead and uh, take these notes here. When we get back, we'll be in the middle of the Exodus at the rise of Moses. And we'll be, for those of you who saw the Exodus in America video, this is going to tie along a lot with that information. But if you did see that video, then you understand a lot more deeply the Exodus route. So what I did in the Exodus in America video is I took all of the information about the Exodus during that time period. And I basically extrapolated everything from dates to time travel, how far they traveled and where could they actually have traveled from based upon the information that we have in the book. So, um, and that'll be interesting because I think these, these travel rates and speeds are major. Okay. So if, for example, if it takes Ezra five months to travel between Jerusalem and Babylon, then the implication there is there's probably at least 1,500 to 2,000 miles, if not more, in between, okay? Now, we know that the current location of Jerusalem and Babylon is approximately the distance from Atlanta to New York, which on foot would take about no longer than two weeks, give or take. And then what you start finding out is that the Exodus was 2 million people. So how could the Exodus with 2 million people travel faster than Ezra with Ezra didn't travel by himself. He had some families with him, but he didn't have 2 million people with him. So these are all gargantuan holes in their proposed theories. And we're just now getting to the part where we can start to pick this stuff up and decipher the bullshit. So um, anyway, go ahead and take these notes. And when we come back, uh, we'll be more, uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll take a more detailed look at the Exodus and then we're going to be off the Exodus because I've gone over the Exodus before, but the Exodus is up out of Egypt once again. And we'll, we'll be playing with these things again. Once again, here's what we're going to see again as a theme in Egypt. We're going to see how once again, the Israelites are being oppressed in Egypt. And then the Exodus does what? What happens during the Exodus? And so we're still, what? We're still writing the same theme of you're going down into it and up out of it. All right? Take the notes. These homo sapiens are the same all over the world. Obviously, when we face the same problems, we will come up with the same answers. To get, to get the same answer in four parallel streams makes it, uh, to me, is, um, seems very unlikely. It's hard to imagine that the Incas went anywhere near Egypt. I find that a bit hard to believe. <laughs> I find you motherfuckers hard to believe. <laughs> if all these sites were built at different times, they can't have been built by the same people. But monuments can't be dated. Only the organic remains found nearby. So did the Incas really build Machu Picchu? Did the Egyptians really build the pyramids? Okay, we are back. So now we're at the Exodus. Um, the story is the Israelites are being oppressed in Egypt. 
and something has to be done. And it seems as though God and or some angel is revealed to Moses, okay? So at this point, this is when he uh, makes the request of Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, of course, Pharaoh does not hearken or listen to Moses. And then you have a string of events that takes place throughout Exodus. Um, probably some of the more popular stories that you've heard about the plagues. And so Moses at this point leads the Israelites out of Egypt. And of course, they're about to cross the Red Sea. Uh, the F Pharaoh actually changes his mind and starts to pursue they get to one side of the sea, Pharaoh pursues into the sea, and the sea takes up the entire Egyptian army as they're pursuing after the Israelites. So from that point on, historically, Egypt's role becomes dramatically diminished, all right? So at this point, at the point that the Pharaoh's guard is drowned in the Red Sea, the role of Egypt has greatly diminished from what it once was. Remember, it used to be the place with the most food, the place of refuge, the place where people who were broke, tired, sick, and hungry, they went to Egypt. Sounds like a place that I'm thinking of that exists today. So, after the death of Moses, if you guys remember, Moses dies as he's trying to lead the children into the land of Canaan. But Moses, um, basically, he was the best military commander in the history of the Israelites. But he wasn't completely faithful. And um, I, I forget exactly what happened, but he, he, he smited the rock and when the water wouldn't come out. So the, the, those were called the waters of contention. And that is when the faith in Moses got tested. Um, and this... I. There's, there's many themes in this story, but I think it's a major theme, the fact that Moses is probably one of the most righteous and definitely uh, one of the most heralded characters and figures from the biblical past. Um, even, he didn't get to make it over into Canaan. He didn't actually get to see the promised land. He actually saw the promised land. He didn't get to be in the promised land. Um, which, you know, I think, I think is... I think there's something I think there's something in that story just for the fact that that small lack of faith that he had. Now, was it was it because Moses had the lack of faith that he wasn't able to see or was it because he lacked faith in front of the other Israelites? I've often wondered that. Um if if Moses in his mind goes through if Moses in his mind goes through something where he he wants he, he wants the water to come out of the rock rather than you know being outwardly frustrated. Would inward frustration also result in the same uh, punishment of not being able to see the land? I, I, I've often wondered about that. Um, is it is it just being able to control your mind or your actions? Um, and anyway, that's just a that's more of a philosophical question as to why Moses was punished. Was it was it the thought or was it the action that actually? Um, that actually caused the punishment. So uh, getting back, so after the death of Moses, uh, Joshua takes over. So if you remember the story of Joshua and Caleb, these were the two spies that spied on the land of Canaan. They were the only ones who brought back positive reports. All of the other spies, 10 of the 12 spies, were some bitch-ass niggas, and eventually that entire generation had to die in the wilderness. So at that time, we've got Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, okay? So um, I'm sure Caleb is in a leadership role um, but we're specifically talking about Joshua and the book of Joshua, what comes after Exodus. So after Moses' death, Joshua is the main commander at this time. Uh, also, there seems to be a theme that kind of gets uh, lost in much of this. These are, these are war stories, okay? Uh, just as much as these guys were men, it seems as though there's some sort of military commander and or general. OK, so these aren't just people walking around and saying, hey, let my people go. Um, when you read the book, you will notice that there are wars and they'll and it's really interesting because there's no there's no play by play. 
anything like that and says, hey, well, there is a little bit of play-by-play, play, but he'll say, you know, we went over here, we utterly smited them niggas, and we over here, and they utterly smited them dudes. So, uh, I don't even know if they use the word utterly, but some cats got smited. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so what happened is, Josh, and it says in Joshua 3.10, without fail, that he was going to drive out the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And it doesn't mention the Egyptians. So I, I, I often thought this was interesting here. So it says, without fail, in Joshua 3.10, that he's going to drive out all of these nations. But specifically, it does not mention the Egyptians. At least not driven from the land in Joshua 3.10. Now, um, you'll go back into later, uh, if you go back into later uh, chapters of Joshua. So in Joshua 3.10, it'll say that he'll drive out these people, me contrast it. It'll say that he will drive out these nations without fail. However, um, other nations still dwell unto this day. So, um, obviously the truth is somewhere between those two points. Um, and, and that's something that we can look at. If we know that he drew, it says that without fail, he drove out many nations and then he named, and then, uh, Joshua 310 names the nations. Okay. Hivites, Parasites, Gergeshites, Amorites, and Jebusites, but not Egyptians. Very interesting. Now, I'm trying to figure out if he drove out all of these other nations, how can they still dwell into this day? So maybe it is a sense of maybe he just uh, annexed the lands that belonged, belonged to the other nations, or maybe he took over those territories where he took over lands, but not necessarily the people of the lands, where it's like, hey, this is our land now, but you can stay here type thing. Um, we're still need, we still really need some clarity to the context of being, of everyone being driven out because we know everybody wasn't driven out. Okay. They still dwell in the lands until this day, but even, um, the idea is that everybody was supposed to be driven off the land. Now, remember that the land of Canaan was just had borders, but then, um, as it says in, what is this? It says in Joshua... Yeah, it says in Joshua chapter 11, verse 23, it says that he took the entire land or took the whole land and gave it as an inheritance to Israel, which means there's a chance that he just took all the land, no matter who it belonged to. So there, there are a couple of things that we that we, that we really need to try to uh, work out in terms of what, what it's actually saying versus what we're reading. Um, but I also wanted to uh, hit this point here. Joshua takes Goshen. All right. So this is major here. So it says he drove out all of these nations. He did not drive out the Egyptians as is written in Joshua 310. But um, I think it's huge. It says that he took Goshen. All right. And we know that Goshen is what? Egypt. Right. Goshen was the part of Egypt that was supposedly attributed to the house of Ramses um, and also attributed to uh, where Joseph had land. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Ghost, jo oh, I'm sorry, Goshen was supposed to be the best of the land. And I can't remember what verse it is, but it actually said that uh, um, historic, not historically, but in the Bible, it said that the land's a desert now, but it used to be well watered. OK, um, I can't remember if it comes up during this. Of course, I'll bring it up. But what I wanted to say here is we know that Josh, Joshua took Goshen and we know Goshen is part of Egypt. All right. So these are things, he took a whole, and here's the thing, he took a ton of lands, okay? If you read Joshua, he took everything, okay? He took it all. Um, but these are, the reason I put, the reason I really like Goshen is because we know it's Egypt. We, we can make a clear parallel. We can make a clear connection between Goshen and Egypt, okay? So now that Joshua's taking all these territories, of course, this is the theme also. You know, we're talking about themes. There are multiple things, right? So we've talked about going down into Egypt, being broke when you're in Egypt. The next thing you know, you're coming out of Egypt with money. You know what I'm saying? Everything, the Israelites were downtrodden into Egypt. They come up out of Egypt. But just like this, we, after the death of Joshua, 
the children went back to their evil ways. So this is another cyclical theme throughout biblical history is that the, the people just can't stay righteous for any long uh, span of time. It seems as soon as there's any sort of uh, peace in the nation, then it doesn't last too long. Um, it seems as though after they get out of the oppression, they get it together for a little bit, but it doesn't last long. So in this case, after the death, after the death of Joshua, the children went back to their whorish ways. So once again, this is another reoccurring thing. So this is really what you get left with. And this is in Judges. So this is after the death of Joshua. Judges is the next book. So um, at this point, like I said, Egypt has a diminished role. And we can actually see um, like in a straight line parallel that uh, we, we can see Joshua actually controls Goshen and plenty of other territories that used to be considered Egypt. We don't know if he has controlled the entirety of Egypt, but it does say that he took the whole land in 1123. So I'm not quite sure exactly what that means, but what we know is from this point on, the kingdom starts to descend a little bit. Now we're looking at the days of the United Kingdom um, and you would think that, hey, you know, uh, and these are supposed to be the good days, but everybody knows there was a lot of war and uh, hot, there's just a hot mess in these years here. And, you know, Solomon got to build the temple. David didn't get to build the temple. And then after Solomon and his children take over, of course, that's when the, the kingdom becomes divided again. So during the divided kingdom is really when um, Egypt comes back as a player against the children of Israel. So go ahead and take these notes. All right. So after Solomon, of course, this is. After the days of Solomon, this is where the king becomes divided again. Okay. And once the kingdom is divided. So once the kingdom is divided, of course it falls. Together we stand, divided we fall. Right? So there are generations to where you had the rulers of Israel and the rulers of Judah. Okay? And so these were divisions of the kingdom. All right? And so during this time, this is really when the nation descended into chaos and ultimately lost control again. So although the United Kingdom starts, you know, it starts in the days of Saul. It finishes in the days of Jehoiachin and Jehoiakim and Jehoiaz and Zedekiah. Okay. So we're going to be talking about that. And mainly this is going to be a result of Josiah's decision. Okay. Okay, as stated, the divided kingdom falls, all right? So why did the divided, why did the kingdom fall? Well, there are a ton of reasons that we don't even really have to get into because we're not talking about the kingdom, we're talking about Egypt. But in Chronicles 35, and specifically in 2 Chronicles 35, 20 through 24, 2 Chronicles 35, 20 through 24, we want to talk about Josiah for a second. Okay. So Josiah decided that he wanted to go to war against Necho the second king of Egypt. Now, as written, Necho says, your God is with me. In other words, Necho the Egyptian. Nietzsche, the Egyptian king, says, your God is with me. And that you shouldn't stand in my way during this war, and or you should probably just help me out. 
something to that effect. Okay, I guess you can read all about it, but it's King of Egypt, Nietzsche II, all right? So what did Josiah do? Josiah decided to deceive the king, and ultimately that, you know, more or less landed, ended with the, the fall of the kingdom. Chronicles 36, 1 through 7. Jeho Ahaz was 23 years old when he was named king, but Nietzsche made Eliakim, who was 25 years old, king after three months and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of the Lord and was bound by Nebuchadnezzar and promoted Jehoiachin, who reigned in his stead and also did evil. So a couple of things to reconcile here. We know that the kingdom ended with Josiah when Josiah went against Nietzsche II, all right? Now, the people named Jeho Ahaz, the 23-year-old king. But Nietzsche made Eliakim, the 25-year-old king, after three months and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of the Lord and was bound by Nebuchadnezzar and promoted Jehoiachin, who was eight years old, who reigned and also did evil. So you're not too young to do evil, apparently. Well, I'm sure Jehoiachin was doing evil after the age of eight, but also did evil. So from this point on, the kingdom has fallen again, all right? So I just want you guys to understand something. After the kingdom is united, and then after Solomon, it becomes divided, and then there's a lot of infighting, with the kingdom and other nations and other nations set upon the kingdom and the kingdom pretty much set upon itself. All right. Josiah decides that he's not going to listen to the king of Egypt who says your God is with you. He deceives the king. As a result, he ends up dying through his ill will. And then the line of succession comes. And the line of succession ends with Jehoiachin, who reigned in his, who reigned in Jehoiakim's stead. And so, what we're going to do now? Now we have what we have now is we have the fall of the king. All right, we've got a lot of stories that are being intermingled together. We've got a lot of different accounts. So, what we're going to do now is. We're going to get out of the historical part and we're going to get into prophecy, which is really some of my favorite stuff, because now we get to be a little more abstract as we're trying to decipher certain things. But it's like we approach things abstractly, but it's I don't know. It's very encouraging that you, you approach something abstractly, but then by the time you're done researching, it comes to a definitive point. And um, that's something that we're going to see here. So what we're going to be doing is we're now going to be looking, especially at prophecy, we're going to be uh, highlighting Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Daniel. So now that we have the history kind of caught up upon until the time that the kingdom falls in Chronicles, okay? And this is after Josiah, all right? This is long after the United Kingdom. This is long after the kingdom has been fighting. Now we're to the point just before Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, all right? So, uh, it's kind of, even reading about Nebuchadnezzar is a lot different than what we think about Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so, we're going to be looking at that as well, uh, just in terms of uh, what, you know, sometimes biblically we, it seems as though through messages of other people that they present someone in a light that may not necessarily be a realistic light. I'm not saying Nebuchadnezzar was good, obviously not. But I think in terms of how we should look at him, it's probably somebody who's not as evil as maybe somebody thinks they are, even though he is pretty freaking evil. Um, he also, uh, for lack of a better word, he also elevated Daniel to the point of prophecy. And if it wasn't for Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and Daniel's prophecies, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the answers to things moving forward like we do now. 
So, you know, many times things just happen for a reason. And so the cool thing is now we're going to get into the prophecy. So we're going to be looking at prophecies in Daniel. We're going to be looking at prophecies in Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at prophecies in Isaiah. And we're going to be uh, paralleling them with things that have happened in history. So right now, and here's the thing. When we get into prophecy, this is like established history that's kind of already covered. All right. Once we start getting into prophecy, this is kind of like the gray area where things you you have to the the script hasn't been written. Okay, they're giving you an outline, and now you have to write the script. So that's going to be pretty fun. So coming up next is prophecy. Go cool? take the notes. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord writeth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight one against his brother, and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof. And they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. And the Egyptians I will give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up, and they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of the fence shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers shall also mourn, and all in that day that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they that spreadeth nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave networks shall be confounded, and they shall be broken in the purposes thereof. all that make saluces and ponds for fish. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools, the princes of Noth are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are of the stay of the tribes thereof. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Neither shall there be any work for Egypt, which the head or tail, branch or rush may do. And in that day shall Egypt be like unto women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt, every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts which he hath determined against it. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts. One shall be called the city of destruction. In that day 
there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof. And it shall be for a sign and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior, a great one, and he shall deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it, and the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite it and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. And in that day, there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, as the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. And in that day shall Israel be third with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Mm -hmm.